other for a while uh, through our contacts at the uh, Professional Organizational Development Network. Um, but he told me to give a very brief introduction. So he told me to tell you he's been a uh, professor of geology at four different institutions, and he's been a full-time faculty developer since 1992. So please welcome Ed Neufer. Has everybody met the person next to them at their table? Actually shaking hands. I figure that's happened since we had a little, I just wanted to check. If you haven't done that, go ahead and do so. <laughs> Great, because you're going to be talking with this person shortly. Okay, there's a thing you've probably heard about called backwards design. It started with Wiggins and McTie. And uh, we're going to do a little of that ourselves. And you notice there's three circles, essential to do, important to do, and then really nice to do if we have time. And so what I want you to do is think about this inner circle for a moment. E what's essential to do? I'd like you to take about 15 seconds and think of that. What do you most want your graduates to be able to do when they leave your institution, whatever that is? Now, just about 20 seconds of silent meditation on that, get something in mind. Okay, now before you do the next activity, this is important, look up here. When I say, give me five, that means when you see the hand waving and you hear five, that means that you put up your hand and everybody goes quiet so we can come back to order and we can continue and I can actually finish the presentation in the time that Anton allowed me to do. So now that you have this idea, I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and exchange what you most hope your students will achieve from completing their undergraduate degree. And notice this is about the degree. It's not your major and it's not your course. Okay, go for it. <laughs> Okay, give me five. Thank you. Okay, just how many of you heard something that had to do with enhanced capacity for thinking? Something like critical thinking? Just put the hands up so other people can look around and see. Okay, how many of you had something to do with career proficiency? How many of you had more content knowledge? <laughs> okay. All right. This method has madness because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be confronting this idea of undergraduate research and how well that it really helps us do what we most want to do. Um, Notice I did two things with the title. One, I added this in because sometimes this word people think, well, it's just the scientists do that and the social scientists. And in reality, what we're talking about, the people in the arts and humanities and the technology and the professional programs, they have a stake in this too. And so their equivalent is right here and we're gonna be including them in this uh, discussion. This is also this idea of reflective high impact practice. And um, what does it mean to be a reflective scholar? And if you haven't confronted this, um, there's a couple of books by Ellen Langer that you should have. And you're going to get this PowerPoint at the end, by the way. There's going to be a little package that Anton will have available, and you can download loads of things, including this PowerPoint. 
And this is the one that I like to uh, refer students to, and I give them a chapter out of this. How many of you would like the chapter that I give students out of this, a copy of that? Okay, good. So that's in, in Anton's package. That's safe. <laughs> okay, but uh, these are definite things to be aware of. And uh, Ellen Langer, she mentions it's kind of an intuitive or mindful state. And it's like new melodies. They're allowed into awareness. Let's see if we get a melody. Oh, it's not, okay, well, it worked before. Okay, well, we won't get a melody at the moment. <laughs> Maybe at the end. <laughs> I don't want everybody to leave. <laughs> But anyway, it is. It's kind of like seeing a new color, uh, that something that you have not imagined before. And uh, this is what research and scholarship independent type uh, creativity does for us. We have to share that with our students. And so now we're into this idea of undergraduate research, uh, creative scholarship. So you might want to think about now how does doing this research support what you most wanted to do, the question that we confronted? Because there's something you want to have happen, so how does this independent research type of experience contribute to that? I'd like you to just reflect for yourself for a moment, because this is really important, because this is a lot of work. <laughs> And you need to think about how does this contribute to what I most want for my students. Now what I want you to think about, if it is done mindfully, what does that look like? <laughs> and so what I'd like you to do is take about another half of a minute and think about if they do undergraduate research, but they don't do it mindfully, what's happening? What are the attributes of that? Share that with your neighbor for about 30 seconds. What's it look like when they don't do it well? Okay, uh, give me five. And can I hear something from one of the tables that you heard? I'll just start with the first one, because I can repeat it. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we said that they just are going through the motions. It's a surface learning. And they don't feel an emotional connection to it. Okay. It's something that they have to do. All right, this is huge. Yeah, there's, an eff there's no effect with it. It's just something that I've signed up that I have to do. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that will definitely not be done reflectively. Now, could I hear one from a distant table over here? We'll see how the sound is if somebody can speak up and share something from your, your table. Yes. Okay, thank you. You know, you, know, you know, these are great, and you probably heard something similar. And, and undergraduate research can be very dangerous uh, because one of the things that we're after when people approach it mindfully is to really think about what in the heck am I doing right here? 
and what kind of questions. And we have to actually guide them. They can't do that themselves. And sometimes what we think is creative scholarship becomes imitation. I can take people out in the field and show them how to do a water sample so they copy just what I do and they learn it well. And they think they're doing science because they're in geology. In reality, they're doing technology. <laughs> and they haven't probably made that distinction of what it is that they're really doing, what's core to the meta-discipline of science or the arts or humanities. And so we really have to be careful, and they have to be careful, that they're not just imitating us and then thinking that they're actually doing a creative endeavor. And so to actually find what makes this different from other types of things that they do is, is huge. And then on a positive note, we'd like to spend about 30 seconds and talk uh, again about if they do this mindfully, what are some of the things you would like to see happen? And go ahead. Okay, give me five. <laughs> Thank you. I noticed it was quieter. <laughs> it was harder to come up. What do I really tell them to get them out of this rut? And so uh, these are some of the ideas that we want to think about today. What do we tell them? How do we keep them from going into this mode of imitation and going for surface learning, going for something that they're not really connected with? And so this is uh, quite a bit about what we're doing. We faculty developers, um, we often work with faculty. And after you get to become sort of a little bit thin on top and a little gray, you begin to think, uh, hmm, maybe, uh, maybe we should be taking this directly to students. <laughs> And so that's going to be my message here. The types of things that you're going to see here, we want you to bring these directly to students. There's uh, those of us in the Cal State system, about 20 of us faculty developers got together and we wrote 15 learning across the curriculum. Well, we actually wrote about 25 learning across the curriculum modules. We have 15 of them ready tested. Um, and uh, how many of you would like copies of those? Okay, good, those go into the, <laughs> the Anton file. And uh, this, this helps bridge these two things of what it means to do mindfully and what happens. But this is huge. Uh, one of the things that we see is that expert learners, they already know when they're not learning. And they take some kind of action about that. And they're able to do that because they're taught how. If we just teach our subject, we don't teach the process very well of learning. And so uh, undergraduate research, creative activity, this is huge opportunity in being able to do so. And novice learners, on the other hand, they have some of the attributes that you named when this was done not very mindfully. They rarely reflect on what's happening. They don't really seem to have a vested interest in doing any better. And it's largely because they haven't been shown how. It's not be, they really do want to learn, but they just, it's almost a given up because they don't know how to go about doing this. So there's a large difference between experts and novice learners, and this undergraduate research experience can help bridge those too. Now the topic of what we want students to learn from research experience, these are some of the things when we've done this elsewhere that we've come up with. Um, elevated critical creative thinking capacities. These are some things that we want to come out of this and you've probably heard these at your table but I'm just sharing a few others that I've heard from doing this elsewhere. 
want them to be independent learners. They're so used to coming into class and doing what they're told, then suddenly we're asking them to do something else. This is huge. It often shows up in graduate school. Nationally, we lose about 50% of our freshmen. We all know that. <laughs> it's a tragedy. They don't graduate from college, 50%. There's another 50% that occurs too, it's our best and brightest. The 50% who start PhD programs do not finish. And the thing that usually is the barrier is they are unable, it's for the first time they've been asked to do something original. And it frightens them. And they think it's a big lie. <laughs> that they're really not smart enough to be there. They really are. They have never understood what's happened to them. But nevertheless, we have this 50% loss of our best and brightest, just as bad as the freshmen. And this is a place where your students can become part of the successful 50% if they can get this idea of what it means to do independent learning. It's not the same thing as classroom learning. Information literacy skills, that's a, a big thing that usually come up that we want people to do. How to, What's the discourse of my discipline? What's the organization of the literature? How do I find information and use it? And then, this is what I've added. <laughs> it's basically, maybe it can undo some of the damage that I've done in my classroom. So by maybe uh, emphasizing other things that uh, we're actually counter to this. And we'll see here, we probably all have done those, uh, but maybe it's just me. There's also two joys of independent scholarship. One of them is creativity and creation. I mean, uh, if you've ever read Studs Terkel's book, Working, there's one group of people who are totally satisfied with their jobs, and that those are the people who can see the product of what they've done. They're like stonemasons who can go by a church and say, I laid that. Or uh, sometimes we can see that some in our students, you know, that we can see this change that they've, from how they've come in from freshmen to seniors. And the other is discovery. The idea that we are now asking questions is a lot more exciting than answering other questions people have put down for us. We never owned that question, so it's hard to have a vested interest in that. Uh, creating questions is much more exciting than just getting answers to questions. And so these are two, uh, these are not well understood. They're very easily confused. How many of you think science is created knowledge? Do we create science or do we discover science? <laughs> if Madame Curie had not discovered radium, would it have been discovered? Some probably, probably would have just found it, right? It was there to be discovered. Most science is that way. If Mark Twain hadn't written Huckleberry Finn, probably wouldn't exist. <laughs> and so we, our disciplines are really kind of divided along these lines, and it's very important to know which one of these two things we are doing. We don't often ask that enough. Like I said, these will be big questions. Some of you have seen Bloom's Taxonomy, and there's an old one and a new one. And the old version has nouns, the new one has verbs. And it used to be evaluative reasoning was the paragon. This is what we aim for. And later on, we said, no, we're going to move evaluation down here. We're going to take the creative part of synthesis and move it to the top. And I've seen people be admonished because they use the old bloom instead of the new bloom. And I don't think that that's probably the right way because what version is best likely depends on what drives our framework of reasoning. This idea of creativity and creating, we really want to think about what that means. 
here. I hope we get sound in this one. Day, or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in a model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula, and it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study done recently of divergent thinking. It was published a couple of years ago. Divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the, the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's a, an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think what Edward de Bono would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways, uh, to see multiple answers, not one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of cod example would be people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? One well, of those routine questions. Most people might come up with 10 or 15. People who are good at this might come up with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paperclip be 200 foot tall and be made out of foam rubber? You know, like, does it have to be a paperclip as we know it, Jim? You know. Um, now, there are tests for this, and they gave them to 1,500 people. This is in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested, of the 1,500, scored at genius level for divergent thinking? Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So what do you think? What percentage at genius level? 80. 80, okay. 98%. Now, the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later, age of 8 to 10. What do you think? 50? They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend here, can't you? <laughs> now, this tells an interesting story because you could have imagined it going the other way, couldn't you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is, we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. And of course, the thing that these, all these children have in common, they've been educated. <laughs> and so one of the things that we're actually looking for in this undergraduate research creative experience is reversing that kind of a trend. This is huge. I don't know whether you've seen these RSA animate films. They're great. You can download them for free. And I, sh I show the whole, this is a, a small clip of about a 20 minute one on creativity. Definitely worth showing to your students. Uh, so that one of the things that we want this mindfulness is that Ellen Langer has noted that the qualities that make up mindful attitude are the same things that stimulate creativity. And those who can focus on process rather than just a product are likely to be creative. And it doesn't matter what your discipline happens to be. Word of the day, meta-disciplines. These are groups of disciplines that hold in common some type of overarching framework of reasoning. And so here's a bunch of things that you see recognized as departments probably in your institutions, but they all fall under the meta-discipline of science. And here are some academic meta-disciplines that you're probably a part of, at least in one of these in some way, or if you're in a professional school like business, you probably associate yourself with a couple of them. Here's an example of metadisciplinary outcomes for the arts. Uh, what we've worked with for several years is interviewing people from the different metadisciplines to try to decide what do we all have in common. So when you look at this, the theater and the sculpture and the painting and the music people, they all have these things in common. These are, so if we say, if you really understand the arts, at least with the citizen literacy, these are some of the things you ought to be able to do. And we have lists of those for all six of those metadisciplines. How many of you would like copies of the metadisciplinary outcomes? Great. This is a great way to start framing Gen Ed. Okay, so that goes in. 
Uh, I just wanted to show you some of these. Uh, we developed the ones probably in science the most because we were the ones that started this, but we're trying to get these conversations going. So if you're a faculty developer and you can get your social scientists together or your artists together and say, what do we have in common? Start with these, but this isn't a, a be all and end all. This is the uh, place to start the conversation. And then maybe how would you prioritize? What things did these people not think of that you'd rather have in there? because this is really what it starts to mean to become educated. Uh, traditions of critical thinking. A lot of people say we want to increase critical thinking with this undergraduate research experience. And uh, this is really worthwhile book to get a hold of. Because in California, we've kind of constrained critical thinking to what Brookfield calls language tricks, detecting language tricks. And it's the usual you know, uh, logic that we teach in many of the logic courses on language. But Brookfield says, no, <laughs> that's not the, the nearly all of critical thinking. That in reality, there's four more traditions of it. And that we actually ha have these in different meta-disciplines. And these are big questions like logic and philosophy, what is truthful, what is ethical? When I see things in the New York Times or <laughs> in Atlantic, let's get rid of the humanities. <laughs> what do we need those for? We need more STEM. My God, do you want science and technology without a grounding in ethics or logic? I mean, I, you know, you can't understand education to even advocate for things like that. What's testable and probable? What's consequential? What's authentic and authentic and valued? What is privileged? These are really big questions. And for one thing, when you realize these are the areas in which these kind of questions are answered, it's very hard to have a kind of a, a disrespect. This is one of the things that unfortunately happens in universities. We've become so ensconced in our disciplines. We begin to think, hey, we've got the best way of thinking of all, and that other people just don't get us. <laughs> well, they probably don't because of the way that we've set up. We've set up a situation where we disrespect each other. This is no way to solve complex problems. And you really need to value, like, yeah, I can answer this, but I need somebody else to tell me what's privileged. I don't understand that well. And I need this for one of these things they call wicked problems. That's another good word of the day, because these are problems that no discipline or meta-discipline can solve by itself. And these are really the problems that face society today. So we could argue about this. I won't give you time to argue. <laughs> yeah, but th these are where I put the X's based on mine. You may want to put them elsewhere. But certainly, one of the things that when students are doing, say, something in science, they'd want to know, answer to themselves as they're doing this independent research project, is how am I exercising evaluative thinking? What is evaluative thinking? Whereas if I'm doing something like a writing, uh, creative writing in the humanities, it's like, wow, what makes this creativity? And so we need to start understanding these big questions of critical thinking and creative thinking. And the creative thinking isn't, it isn't used enough in academia. All we hear is the word critical thinking, and sometimes we have a very narrow view of that. So we want to understand a little bit about how students think about this. One of them is to give a little handout, probably the first chapter, what is critical thinking? the students, because if you ask your students to complete a sentence, matter of fact, go back to your class and do that. Critical thinking is, and ask them to complete that sentence, then take up the papers. <laughs> and you'll probably find if you have 40 students, you have at least 30 different versions of what it means to do critical thinking. We use the term, but we don't really bother with getting a shared understanding of what we mean by it. Well, that's a good place to do that. So certainly the one chapter out of there is quite useful. And that's a book that's written for us. 
but we should be sharing this kind of thing with our students directly, like our colleagues, not something that we hide from them and do to them. Uh, really, we should be sharing this uh, together. Uh, for creative scholarship, um, two books, Mihaly, Creativity. Uh, second edition, make sure you get the second edition. It just came out fairly recently, because he had some errors in the first when he owns up to these. Uh, but uh, we should be doing some, write, uh, some uh, reading. So if a student's doing an independent research involving a creative project, why not have them check out one of these books or even buy a book or at least have several in your department where they check out one of those and they read this as they do it. Uh, I see you're squinting up here, but that's okay. You're going to get the PowerPoint with, these <laughs> with the book things up there, so you'll be able to... You don't need to worry about taking notes, but these are really good. We, we like to, to build the understanding. And for all uh, students, uh, there's a really excellent uh, paper called The Expert Learner, Strategic Self-Regulated and Reflective, that should be read by students. It talks about what an expert learner really is, what you do when you're an expert learner, and it gets them started. So these are some of the things that we do naturally, and we assume students do, but they don't. <laughs> and they often cannot unless they're taught how to do it. It's what kind of problem is this? What seems to be the best strategy for solving it? What kind of reasoning is most appropriate? Is this something that can be solved by science? Or maybe not at all? Uh, by science. We need another meta-discipline. How will I know if I solved it correctly? What additional information or what kind of help do I need to do this? Maybe I can't do it all myself. Maybe I have to call two or three people that I know have this expertise in order to make this package work. And then how can I take this, what I use from this, and transfer it over to other areas of life. If I do my research project, beyond the research project, what's it give me a value in my life? We do this pretty naturally. Uh, we've done this because we're survivors of the system, and we've had to do this. Those who don't survive haven't learned to ask these questions. You notice that what we're starting asking people to do in the independent research, we're starting now to get to these things. So what do they do if they do it mindfully, these little things that were hard uh, to, to draw out? Uh, this is from my colleague Carl Worth. He and I do a lot of this. He's another geologist at McAllister College. But uh, this idea of expert learners, they have metacognitive knowledge, and they have this thing called metacognitive control. It's not just enough to know about metacognition. But what do they do? And so these three, air, these ovals in here are really actions that they do. And they're done mindfully because they have reflection in action, reflection on action, and reflection for action. And in the center are the things that Anton brought up. These are our affective attributes. And we're reflecting constantly, how do I feel about this? And then down here, there's kind of a mega reflection now that I've learned this, how can I use this in other types of personal tasks? How can I add that to my knowledge base in order to do, take some of the information that I hear, some of the learning that I've done, and take it into an entirely different kind of a problem? And so that's kind of a short version of what's in that uh, paper. How many of you would like an Ertmer newbie paper? Okay, <laughs> in the package. Ooh, what is learning? Another big thing you can ask your students. You'll get all kinds of things. Uh, there's my uh, wonderful colleague, Bob Lemonson. He passed away a few years ago. He wrote a, a book on thinking about teaching and learning. But there it is at the biological level. The brain learns by building and stabilizing neural connections. And so what are we trying to wire in when we do this? Good question. <laughs> A lot of us have different ideas about it, and students have vastly different ideas maybe than what we think they have. Well, no student would probably argue that we're not trying to wire in knowledge. 
knowing stuff. That's something that they attribute, uh, that they associate with education. Skills, how to do things, and some type of reasoning or thinking. Now these are not simple things to distinguish where the boundaries are. And so we actually have to guide students in what it is that we mean for those to occur. And we do all of these. But even the term knowledge can produce a lot of misunderstanding. We can think of it as the bottom level of bloom. Just give us the facts. <laughs> and it's really memorized and retained knowledge. But when you go into the literature, you notice that there's things like introspective self-knowledge, which is very different. That's a reflective type of thing. It's not memorizing things at all. Metacognitive knowledge, if you noticed in that one of those earlier slides, there were three different kinds of knowledge associated with metacognitive, which were reflection and thinking. And they were actually, they're really more like reasoning than knowledge. And so our language is really not well suited. Uh, we would, but we, we, we're stuck with what we have. The cat's out of the bag, so we have to live with it. If you ask students to give an example of a skill, they'll usually give something like a psychomotor skill, like skiing if you're in Utah, or surfing if you're in California, or dancing you know, if you're in one of the fine arts. Uh, they understand the skills in terms of psychomotor, but we talk about critical thinking skills as though it were something like a dance step, which is very, very different. So we use this skill term in a very nebulous way. And then reasoning, oh my gosh, uh, you use reasoning suddenly. If you dare use reasoning at Humboldt State, the, immediately the, uh, the philosophy of the department will come out with Claus Baird saying there are only two kinds of reasoning, inductive and deductive, and you can't use these terms such as quantitative reasoning, even though uh, it's, everybody does it. And, and so those, those call problems. And then, of course, metadisciplinary reasoning. There's a certain framework of reasoning of the arts, of the sciences. Ethical, logical, intuitive is the kind of reasoning. So. Uh, these things can, can, you need to be very clear about what it is. So in this presentation, we're use, mainly using the knowledge as pretty much the way students understand it as the lower bloom level. And skills are things where we actually have to do it more than once intentionally <laughs> in order to develop a proficiency. And then we actually, here we're taking of this reasoning as something to gain understanding for taking action. And with practice, the stage of developments bring increased intellectual, affective, and ethical capacities. If you haven't seen this literature, we can look at it. But let's look at three different experiences that students might have had at the start because these are the students that are coming at you into these independent research projects. And so here's an, uh, one that might come out of an introductory course in general education in science. And you may have seen this. We impart the, the, the knowledge that citizens ought to know. And in science literacy, we can find these things out there. All radioactivity is man-made. Radioactive milk can be made self by boiling it. The earliest humans lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. And you respond by agree or disagree, and that's a certain kind of literacy. And many introductory courses, they're 100% knowledge. And we don't think about why are we giving this introductory course. Then there's a skills-based. I've done a lot of this, <laughs> true confession strives to impart an excitement and enthusiasm for my discipline. I tell you that stu my students will understand science by doing science. I found out later that was wrong. <laughs> but I, it was something that many of us have studied and practiced for a long time. And so we do things in applied research. We take them out in the field early. Or we take them into the laboratory early. 
and we do some type of thing we call an authentic experience where they actually do an investigation and they do they do science and in fact this is a very successful approach for recruiting majors if I can get a van load of 16 students out of my freshman class out on a weekend field trip they come back about 15 of them majors <laughs> it's very easy way they're excited about it. it's like wow I love this and so we should do some of this but we have to think what about the other people who are not going the other 90 people who are not the 16 in the van <laughs> what are we doing for them and so here's a third way of emphasizing through reasoning what we call citizen science literacy it's not the idea of making little geologists into professional geologists but it develops through taking something we do in general education and pulling it forward no matter what major that we're in into the majors that we have and so knowing that radioactive milk can't be made safe by boiling it's a nice fact but how if you're a business major or a psychology major how how do you pull that forward well, you can't. It, 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 it does not enable easy transferability. But if we begin to understand what, how do, what science is, how does it work, how do, we under, how do we understand and explain the physical world? That's something that gets pulled forward pretty easily. And particularly, why do people value this? How do they get good at it? One thing, it generates a lot of respect for other ways of thinking if we approach it this way. So now try this with your students sometime. I will know I have received a good education through the following criteria. It's a nice thing to do maybe with your freshmen. Ask them to complete that sentence and collect the responses. And you're going to find probably different affections for different three of the categories. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He's recording. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm messing with the technology. Sorry about that. Um, but in reality, a lot of students think that becoming educated is just knowing stuff. A lot of our politicians think that too. And that seniors are. They know more stuff than freshmen. Graduate students know a lot more than seniors. And professors, wow, they know a lot. But they view education not as enhanced reasoning, it's just knowing content. That's, that's how it is taken. And you'd like to be able to collect those in the freshman year, and you'd like to have these things revisited. <laughs> Maybe every other year, at least, to see how that changes because they come in with certain ideas and these we want to know what their ideas are about this because that's how they're going to engage that creative research project so you might think about what does what happens when a student who thinks that education is about knowledge suddenly comes in to hit an independent research what difficulties are they going to have a person that comes in skills they will usually think, how's this going to get me a job? Because they're thinking about how the practical thing, and it's all skills-based. And unfortunately, this gets left out. So, a piece of paper, <laughs> or you can just doodle with your finger on the table. What I'd like you to do, just take one of the courses that you have now, and draw your own circles to scale. That if I want to emphasize all knowledge, I'll just have one circle there. If I want to emphasize a lot of skills, I will have some knowledge, some skills, and reasoning. But I'd like you to think about it as what, what it is that you want to do. Just draw three circles.
we had a group of uh, 10 of us that were scientists uh, came together to answer this kind of question ourselves. And we wanted something like this. We wanted a balance. But we discovered <laughs> we had built this. It was so easy to gravitate to this that this got shoved off to the side. And we saw it, and it's doubtful that the students maybe even saw that. And the way we found this out is we employed a science literacy concept inventory that looked at whether people understood what science is and how it worked. And we discovered the same thing nationally later. This has got a 12,000 student database and it's still growing. One of the things it shows us is that introductory science courses don't produce science literacy. They don't produce a citizen understanding of what science is and how it works even though in our catalogs, this is what we promise we're going to do. <laughs> and so they have, they, so it doesn't matter whether you have none, one, two, three, or four mm -hmm. courses, you really don't get a big jump until you've gotten past four. These are the majors. And if we, we're gonna have a science group together, we'll talk in more detail about what the, this horrified us. And this happened in our courses too, even though we thought we were doing something else. And the result was we started to teach differently. We started making sure that reasoning circle got bigger. And we got different results afterwards. But we assumed certain things were happening and then we saw our colleagues across the country, they have the same assumptions. They're getting the same results too. How many of you have a written teaching philosophy? Yes. How many of you have guided your students to develop a written learning philosophy? Just a few, okay? This is something that's really important to do. It's their counterpart and they should be developing us. This undergraduate research project is a huge opportunity. A lot of our students come in with a fixed mindset and we see the types of students that we saw over here. This is from Carl Dweck. I give my students a, a chapter out of Carol Dweck. How many of you would like a Dweck chapter? Okay, good. <laughs> Versus growth. And this is really what's needed to succeed in an independent research thing. If you're back here, you have to make this switch to here. And of course, telling them how to do that's pretty important. This is one of the things we need to do. Stages of intellectual development. I'm gonna finish in one minute here. Uh, this is well established and we never use it. We all went through this even though we've forgotten it. <laughs> a lot of people think that everything has a right and wrong answer. And they're very frustrated when we don't give that to them. Once they discover that authority doesn't have all the right and wrong answers, they begin to think every, every answer is equally valid. And they go through this for a long time. Most of our students at the freshman, sophomore levels are in this Perry stage three. They don't want to hear it from us. They don't trust authority anymore. This is why cooperative learning works so well. <clears throat> They'd rather hear it from each other. So let's structure it that way so they hear it from each other. It's better for them. This is where most people graduate with a baccalaureate degree. They realize that not everything has a right and wrong answer, but they don't not yet know how to engage the framework of reasoning to resolve which is better. And that's scary because it really tells that our people cannot use evidence with a baccalaureate degree nationally at this stage. This independent research thing is huge. This is the place we might be able to make that jump from three, from four into the next stage where we'd like them to be. They can use evidence and it can accept that evaluations lead to best solutions are relative to context. The hunting and fishing laws that work well in Idaho don't work well in Southern California. You, know, you just can't take a, a, a particular result and impose it everywhere. It's, it's variable. And this is usually where we'd like our graduate students to be. They like this kind of challenge and they're comfortable with it. If you can't make the challenge into that, that's probably where the 50% goes that don't make it through to finish their dissertations. And this is kind of developing wisdom over 
a long period of time. We usually don't do very much with that in the universities unless we have start with older students who already have some of it. Last thing, if we were going to learn, guide development of a philosophy, maybe a rubric for this creative thing, is what are some of the things we look like? And we've kind of touched on these. Uh, do they understand, is it evaluative or creative thinking? Uh, is this mainly about developing knowledge, skills, reasoning? Have you considered multiple ways to interpret this evidence you gathered or multiple ways that somebody might interpret a painting that you've created? Um, how does this exemplify doing science or doing art or doing technology? Employs evidence to reach conclusion. Have you confronted some assumptions? You start in and learn something different. Did this surprise you in any way? Context. And so these are just some of the kinds of things that we could put in there as a rubric. And I'm not saying this is the end all. You could say, hey, two of these are really good. I can use them. I got three more that I think are better that you'd put in. But you want a rubric out there to guide people through some of these things because students aren't going to be able to acquire it by themselves. We actually have to bring it to their attention so they can work on it. So anyway, there's been a lot of big picture things uh, presented there, so uh, make sure you share some of them with your students, and you're going to go to wonderful sessions today. Uh, make sure you share those directly with your students, too. Uh, don't do it to it, do it with your students rather than to them. Well, thank you. <laughs>